Here now is H.M.S. Richards, the voice of prophecy speaker. His subject, the years before time ended. Suppose we take our place on some planet, the great central planet, for instance, we call heaven. We assume that we have been welcomed by our Lord as among the faithful. We have been caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And from this continuity of existence, which we call eternity, we are looking back into the era of time, back before Christ's second advent, to the days in which we now live, the years which we call the latter days, the years before time ended. We shall try to describe those last days of the earth from the vantage point of the redeemed. To facilitate this, let us look back from where we stand right now, this year, to the years before our Lord's first advent to this world and the subsequent destruction of Jerusalem, which is a type of the end of the world. As we look back through the telescope of history, we are surprised that the people of those days did not recognize what was coming. It seems that they had every reason to know that Jesus of Nazareth was the true Messiah, the Son of God. Why didn't they recognize him? Why didn't they receive him? Someone may say, well, why should they? How did they know who he was? How could they know? The answer is that they had every opportunity to know. Jesus didn't come to this world without previous announcement in the writings of Holy Scripture. The prophets of God had predicted his coming. There had indeed been signs of the times. And to the men of Christ's generation who rejected him, he said, O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, that is, you can read the weather from the signs in the heavens, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? That's Matthew 16, verse 3. That was the trouble with the people of those days. They paid no attention to the signs of the times which stared them in the face. For instance, what sign had the prophet Isaiah given nearly 700 years before by which Jesus might be known as the true Messiah? Listen, Isaiah 7:14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Was this fulfilled? It certainly was. Here's the record in Matthew 1.22. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. When you read the preceding verses, you will discover that this is the story of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ in Bethlehem, born of the Virgin Mary, conceived of the Holy Ghost. He entered this world without a human father. That's the testimony of Scripture. Here's another sign that should have been recognized. Micah 5, 2. But thou Bethlehem, Ephrata, the very town is named from which he should come who was to be the true Messiah, the true Christ. Then we turn to the ninth chapter of Daniel's prophecy. And it's clear that Jesus was not only to be born in the town predicted and in the way predicted, but that he was to begin his ministry at the very time predicted. The first 69 weeks of the 70-week prophecy of Daniel, the ninth chapter, reached to the year A.D. 27. At that very time, Jesus appeared at the Jordan River for baptism. Read it in your own Bible and see. Strange to say, the people of Christ's day expected him to come as a king, a great military leader to overthrow their enemies, the Romans. And because he did not come in that way, they rejected him, or at least neglected him. What about the days just before his second advent, the times in which we live? Remember, we're looking back now, the days, weeks, months, and years before time ended. The apostle Paul wrote, As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming, then cometh the end. 1 Corinthians 15. It is that last sentence, then cometh the end, that our modern mind doesn't like to accept. It's not God's plan that we should always be worrying about the end, but certainly we should take it into account. A man of 70 or 80 years of age should not always be thinking about his approaching death, but if he is a wise man, he will certainly take it into account and not ignore it. It would be foolish for him to enter into plans that might call for 20, 30, or 40 years more of life. 
At least he will make his will. He should have done so long since. Now C.S. Lewis, the well-known British scholar and writer, reminds us that what death is to each man, the second coming of Christ is to the whole human race. We have absolute proof that every human life is precarious, short, temporary, provisional, and no one should give all of his heart to anything which ends when his life ends. Even Christians find it hard to remember that the whole life of humanity, as we know it, is also short, precarious, temporary, and provisional. Yes, indeed it is. Dr. Lewis reminds us also that most scientists now join with the theologians in declaring that all the great achievements of our civilization, which are of this world, will actually come to nothing in the end. That mankind in all his history, while longer lived than men individually, is equally mortal as are they. The only point on which the scientists and the theologians differ is that the scientists expect a slow decay from within, while the theologians, according to the Holy Scriptures, know that the end will come with a sudden interruption from without, at some moment when we are not expecting it. As we look back from the bright planet, we see that for about 200 years before the uh, before the end came, there was more and more talk about the possibility of such a, an event. In fact, it rose with such crescendo that it aroused a great public reaction against it, especially among the intelligentsia, the scientists, the philosophers, others who were quite well pleased with their own accomplishments in what uh, they call this modern and later the atomic age. The basic philosophy taught in the schools, published in the newspapers, assumed by most educated people, was the evolutionary doctrine of progress and uniformity. In reply to the preachers of the actual end of time, these men declared, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of. Second Peter 3, verse 4 ignorant of the creation of the world by the word of God in the beginning, ignorant that the whole creation is sustained by the word of God, ignorant that it came to an end once in the great deluge, ignorant that it will meet a fiery end in the day when the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, or as the original Greek puts it, in an atom, in the flash of an eye. As we look back from eternity into time, we see twelve great signs which should have informed intelligent minds of the great changes coming. Signs clearly predicted by the world's supreme intellect. These twelve signs may be listed as follows. Now note carefully. First, the increase of knowledge. Daniel 12.4 Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. The great scientific age in which we live. Second, an unparalleled running to and fro all sorts of travel over the earth. Third, the great dark day of May 19, 1780, Mark 13. Fourth, great star shower of November 13, 1833, also in Mark 13. Five, wars and rumors of wars, distress of nations, Matthew 24, 6. Six, worldwide peace movements, Isaiah the second chapter. Seven, lawlessness and immorality, Luke, the 17th chapter. 8. Disturbances in nature, pestilence, earthquakes, storm. Isaiah 24. 9. Social and economic revolution and conflict. James, the 5th chapter. 10. A worldwide wave of spiritualism and religion. 1 Timothy 4. 11. The great apostasy from the Christian faith. 2 Timothy 3. 12. And last. The proclamation of the gospel. To all nations in the last generation, Matthew 24, 14. Before the first advent of Christ to this earth, the signs and prophecies which had clearly predicted his coming were ignored by most people. And before his second coming, the signs of the times again are ignored by great multitudes. But some will be looking for them. Of them it had been written, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Revelation 14, 12. That these people would be on earth just before the coming of Christ 
at the end of time as such is clearly seen by reading the following verse. And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. That's Revelation 14:14. 14, 14. So the people pictured are here just before Christ comes. Looking at things from this standpoint over an eternity as we look back into the years before time ended, it seems that at least four of these great signs should have convinced the last generation that it was the last. The first of these is the increase of knowledge, the sudden outburst of scientific exploration of the human mind and of nature, the like of which the world had never seen anything before. Thousands and thousands of years had passed by. People thought, lived, traveled in the same old way. Suddenly, in the last 200 years of the world's life, the whole world was ablaze with intellectual activity. After 6,000 years of plodding along with the speed of an ox team, suddenly power-driven motors send the world into a dizzy spiral. Millions and millions of vehicles propelled by steam, petroleum products, atomic energy. The heavens are filled with commerce. The earth with vehicles. The second great reason why they should have known, telescoping time and putting ourselves back in the 20th century from eternity and knowing as millions did that that century was the most warlike of all the centuries in the history of the earth, in which millions were killed and billions of dollars spent. It seems that no one remembered the second great sign that Jesus gave. You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Matthew 24, 6. In the third place, in some strange way, it seems now as we think of it that the great apostasy from the Christian faith, everywhere evident in the last two centuries of earth's time, should have failed to impress more Christians with its ominous meaning. The scientific age, the age of knowledge, with the tremendous physical progress, departing from the faith, not because the faith was unbelievable in the light of science, but because it was unpalatable to the heart of pride. Only a few comparatively listen to the words of apostolic prophecy. This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. It goes on and gives 19 sins which will be prominent at that time. And then... Listen to these words, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, professing themselves to be Christians or to be at least religious. Second Timothy 3, first verses. And the fourth great sign which men should have seen was this, prevailing unbelief and the proclamation of the gospel in the middle of it going to all the world. The wonderful, wonderful worldwide proclamation of the gospel. That was the greatest, most wonderful sign of all. We see consecrated preachers going everywhere, great publishing houses rolling the presses night and day, television programs, radio broadcasts. Above all, the gospel going by word of mouth from friend to friend, stranger to stranger, reaching like a wave of benediction around the world, proclaiming the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus until the last man in the outermost corner has heard it. That's the great sign that we see everywhere now. We think the voice of prophecy is a part of that great sign. My friends, as we look back from eternity into the years before time ended, we see those things. Friends, we're living in those years now. What will it be like when we look back to them? What a view it would be to look back from eternity into our time. Isn't it really time for us now, while there is time, to look forward to that day when there shall be no time in that world of tomorrow? For the past, present, and future are all alike to God.